for this morning tells us part of Luke's gospel, a portion of the greatest story ever told, particularly well known to us, expected even in this time of year. I'll be reading the words in yellow print. I invite you to read loud. Not that loud, but allow the words in white. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that was, took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. do we know about the Christmas story? Maybe more to the point, how do we know what we think we know? I remember leading a group of 25 middle school students for a Christmas party, a little bit of a study time during their youth group meeting, and gave them a little written quiz about what they knew about the Christmas story. I asked them, for example, how many kings visited Jesus, according to Matthew? You know what their answer was. What was it? We three kings. Three, right? I said, wrong. <laughs> because according to Matthew, doesn't call them kings. They're only wise men, magi, a particular group of religious people. They're sent who were inspired to follow the line of the star. The grown up version of that story is the question well, how many kings visited Jesus at the manger on Christmas? Typically we say three. three. You got it right. First of all, they weren't kings. They didn't get to the manger. They weren't there on Christmas. <laughs> One of the mothers of the middle school kid apparently upset that her child could have got something wrong on a quiz at a Christmas party. <laughs> said, well, no, but the song says, we three kings. And I said, yeah, but the song is not the gospel of Matthew. And if Christmas songs dictate the truth to us, then we all need to sign a get well card because apparently grandma got run over by a grandma. <laughs> It is our entire freedom. We are completely free to read scripture, to interpret scripture, to discover what it means for us, how it may direct us, inspire us, comfort us, challenge us. It is our individual freedom. But it, part of that freedom requires that we do distinguish between what's really there and what we just think is there. And our memory 
abilities get changed and our knowledge is affected not only by what's there but by what someone else told us and and Christmas movies we've seen and songs we've sung and nativity scenes that we enacted our entire lives. Our heritage as disciples of Christ, in fact, insists on that individual freedom to explore, interpret, and understand Scripture as we individually see fit. It's the reason why some of our ancestors in faith walked away from the Baptists in their day. It's the reason why some of our ancestors in faith were kicked out of the Presbyterian Church in their day. Because we simply would not accept someone else telling us what we had to believe. No creeds. No doctrines. No list of absolute fundamental beliefs. No one they would call tests of fellowship. Things that you have to believe if you want to be one of us. We simply rejected all of that. And instead decided all we need is some common understanding of Jesus as Christ. And we will embrace and respect and celebrate the diversity that emerges from that common understanding. That we not only are free to interpret and believe, we are individually responsible to do so. And so maybe it does matter what's actually in the scripture. Maybe it's important for us to determine for ourselves what we believe and how it shapes us. And maybe it's important for us to pull back any time we want to tell someone else what they must believe. As I look at today's scripture, as I see something, I, I see something that perhaps only for me speaks a word of comfort. Perhaps to others it's not there. But it seems important to me that this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem was there because he belonged. Because his father belonged. <coughs> you heard the story. What, what all kinds of things had to happen to explain why it happened in Bethlehem. The Roman occupation of Palestine, the fact that Roman authorities could require people to engage in a census, the fact that their tradition required that you go to the town of your birth, of your heritage, in order to register for the census, the fact that Joseph was, in fact, of the tribe of Judah, a direct descendant of David. Now, let me tell you, David the king had several wives, several, several children. One of his sons was Solomon. Solomon, we're told, had 300 wives, 3,000 concubines. It's impossible to know how many children he had. It's possible that everybody living in Jesus' day was a descendant of David. But Joseph was certainly among them and could trace his heritage. And it was important that he belong to this rich heritage, to this people of God. Because he belonged, his son would belong. And because they were of the line of David, they were to go to Bethlehem. Traveling there with his betrothed. And while they were there, it came time for her to give birth. Because
because he belonged. He belonged to something with a rich heritage. Something that meant something. Something that united people. Something that comforted them. And helping them understanding who they were. Something that gave them a community memory of the long faithfulness of God. As I personally, individually, look at what Scripture says, and as certain words jump out at me on even, any given day, that's what jumps out at me is this Christmas occurred. He was there because he belonged. We are here because we belong. We belong to the family of God. We belong to this rich, abundant heritage that celebrates Jesus as the sign of God's grace poured out upon the world. We belong to a long community of faith with great memories of people who have embodied that grace in our lives. We belong to a congregation of people who have not only received but expressed that grace in our communal congregational life. Particularly in a day when people are being divided in this world. And when the division becomes not just chaotic but destructive. Particularly in lives in which we are sometimes so beaten up and worn down that we feel like we are all alone. When, like Jesus, we feel rejected, isolated, betrayed by what life has done to us. The message that we belong to God, that we belong among those who are cherished, to those who know the grace that saves us all, is truly good news. And we've already talked a little bit this month about how difficult it is at times for us to believe good news. We just as soon have no news because life sometimes teaches us to anticipate and to expect that news is going to be bad. It's particularly true when the news is going to bring a great deal of change <coughs> to our lives. The older we get, the less welcome change usually is. The more difficult it is to believe that something that fundamentally changes our lives is actually good news. Matthew and Luke only wanted to bring us good news, and they had to work very, very hard at it, developing and sharing this extensive backstory, connecting it to primer prophecies doing whatever they can to help the people who would read or hear of their story to believe it. And 2,000 years later, it's still difficult given the ways of the world, given the experiences of our lives, to believe in good news. But it is our gift. And contrary to everything we've been taught and everything that we've been teaching all our lives, Christmas is not a season of giving. Christmas is a season of receiving. Christmas is not about what we do and what we give. Christmas is about what God has done 
and what God has given through this child in a manger. Christmas is there so that we might, as unworthy as we think we are, and as beaten up as we often can be, that we might receive this good news. To understand that we belong, that we are loved, that God did all of this in hopes that we would receive such good news. In hopes that we would also understand that we is a global word. That God did this for everyone. That all God's children everywhere, regardless of their nationality or their race or their religion or their behavior, Everyone is offered the same gift of God's grace. It's a life changer. It's a world changer. And yes, when we receive it, it changes the way we look at each other. And it changes the way we look at the stranger. And it changes the way we look at those who even call themselves our enemies. It looks at the way in which we establish our priorities and disperse our life and our gifts and our energies. And that's good news. Good news for us. Good news for the world. For it is God's great hope that we might feel the full warmth and the power of belonging to the people of God people that has no limit, no boundary, no end. Embraced by a God whose grace is eternal. Good news. Here to save us from what the world does to us. Here to save us and redeem us from what we've done to ourselves. Here to give us reason to find hope and peace and joy and love. May that be your gift from God and all who have believed and all who will. Let us pray. We are grateful, oh God, that by the grace we've experienced and the people you put in our lives, we have come to believe, sometimes barely, that we are your beloved children, that grace rules the day. Despite what the world has done to us, despite our own foolishness and rebelliousness, despite our losses and griefs and disappointments, despite everything that threatens to destroy our hope and threaten our peace and end our joy, you love us through it all. And you have loved us through the people here in this room and you have loved us through the lives of those who live so powerfully yet in our memories. And you love us powerfully through the life and ministry of Jesus, the one who continues to come to us anew every time we reflect upon him, every time a light shines upon us and we understand you even more clearly than before. So as Christmas comes to us, oh God, help us to see something new, something even more powerful, something even more wonderful. And may it be reflected in who we are and how well we know we are loved and how well we love. In Jesus' name.